All right, welcome to Wise Up On Air. Damien Kaspauer, and Software Product Manager here at Audio Kinetic. It's great to be joining you today. Uh, we got some excitement lined up and it starts now. So get settled. Uh, we're gonna talk game audio. We're gonna talk interactive sound. We're gonna talk music with emotions. But first we're gonna dig into some news about what's happening at Audio Kinetic. Uh, in the news, uh, we'll be covering a few exciting things that you'll want to take a peek at. Uh, we'll also dig deep into the community, uh, what's happening with Audio Kinetic out in it, as well as our wise community spotlight uh, which surfaces cool things folks are doing out there in the world. And then we'll fast forward to our developer spotlight, um, where we'll be joined by the folks behind Season, A Letter to the Future. Uh, we're going to dig into Sonic storytelling, in-game binaural recording. I know folks are on the edge of their seat about that. This is a super cool feature that... Uh, yeah, really speaks to the art form. So stick around for that. And moving straight into it, beta. Why is 2023.1 coming soon in, oof, I've, I can almost feel it. It's so close. Uh, and of course, this beta version is an opportunity for folks to give a, a try on the new stuff that we've put in the box for the release coming later this fall, but you can get early access to it and try it out, uh, providing some feedback so that we can continue to evolve and iterate it uh, towards that release this fall. But uh, you want to keep them peeled for news about the beta uh, as well as a live stream that we'll dig deep into those features. So stay tuned for that. The free Strata sample pack that we talked about on the last Wise Up On Air that featured the folks from Hardspace Shipbreaker gave an overview of the new Strata Sample O2 collection, uh, bringing a bunch of new samples across uh, different libraries that you can get your hands on right now. Uh, additionally, we have a bunch of more collections coming out over the pat over the next months. Um, I know that there's some uh, exciting Strata content uh, that we'll be featuring on one of our live streams coming up later this summer. So keep them peeled for that. And right now. Jump over to audiokinetic.com, uh, get your free Strata sample packs, and give that a try. This is our new sample library in multi-track format. Uh, gives you all the pieces, uh, as well as the ingredients for creating these uh, incredible samples. Uh, and yeah, get signed up to stay tuned for those collections as they continue to arrive each month. So speaking of the community, here comes Audio Kinetic to the UK. Uh, head of product Simon Ashby uh, is swiftly on his way over to Brighton for the develop conference next week. So if Folks in the UK uh, will have a chance to touch base with Audio Kinetic out there in the community at Develop, uh, wishing everyone a great conference and really valuing that knowledge share and being part of that experience of, you know, exchanging ideas around interactive audio. It's how we all get better and continue to evolve this art form. Uh, additionally, we'll be landing at the game SoundCon in the fall at their new Burbank location. Looking forward to checking that out. 
so hopefully we'll see some of you there. Uh, good to see some folks in the chat. Hey, thanks for coming. And uh, definitely keep us posted as we continue to weave our way through this episode and let us know if there's anything uh, that we can help uh, surface as part of this. Uh, if you're interested in getting a level up across a couple of different feature areas, I want to raise uh, these uh, classes for you. The first one is interactive music, um, accelerated training to create meaningful interactive experiences using wise music systems. So this is going to be a uh, teacher directed um, limited space class to accelerate your workflows in interactive music featuring Dave Kahlberg. Uh, Dave's someone I've had the pleasure of learning from in the past. Uh, he's an educator by trade and does a great job of, you know, bringing you along on this journey. Fantastic teacher. And so jump over to audiokinetic.com and our events page. You can uh, get signed up for that and get accelerated in interactive music. Uh, the other ones we have coming up are a couple of on-demand workshops featuring the Unreal integration. So if you've been on the edge of getting started with Unreal and Wise, we've got a couple of, you know, again, opportunities to get one-on-one -on -one or one-on with the group and, uh, and Mads Moretti Sondrup. Again, fantastic educator out there in the community, was just um, the keynote speaker at DevGam last month and weaves a fantastic narrative uh, to bring you into the process of integrating with Unreal and Wise. So a couple of sessions coming up there that you can get signed up for and really, again, accelerate your process. Uh, if you've dug in a bit, uh, this can help you move faster. So it's great to have those educational initiatives out there for folks to jump in. It's summer, right? Maybe you've got some free time. Maybe you're between things. Maybe you just uh, want to soak up the sun and learn wise at the same time. Uh, whatever the situation is, um, there's a couple of great opportunities for you there. And if you're looking for more content, the Audio Kinetic blog is something that we are constantly feeding with developer stories. Uh, again, trying to carry their experience to the community out there using WISE and really just engaging with sound interactively as part of these experiences that are being created. And one of the things that uh, Audio Kinetic participated in over the last year was the Step Up Your Sound Game Jam that Dolby hosted, where five developers uh, integrated the uh, integrated WISE in their project on mobile devices, leveraging Atmos for mobile, creating unique sonic experiences that really leverage sound. Um, and this whole process is exposed as part of the game jam through uh, Dolby, along with uh, our surfacing of these developer stories at the Audio Kinetic blog. So great behind the scenes, some really cool games that came out of it. Uh, there's There was one winner uh, who has now gone on to publish their game. You can go grab it. It was the Witch's Witch title here. And uh, yeah, again, just great to have the community out there thinking with audio, building experiences that really focus on what sound can bring, uh, which is a recurring theme of this episode for sure. But I wanted to surface a couple of folks who have I've come across in the last months uh, out there on the internet doing some cool things uh, in the WISE community. 
the first person I want to focus on is David Weaver, who created a plugin uh, for downsampling and bit crushing uh, with Wise. And uh, I'm going to spin the quick excerpt that they shared and uh, give you a peek at that. So again, just a really cool illustration of someone creating a plugin from scratch uh, in Wise to do something that uh, that's not in the box, uh, extending what the capabilities of uh, of Wise are for a specific need or a development is something that we're always interested in seeing. It's great to see folks out there doing it, and there's a ton of information out there that we provide to help people get started with creating a plugin for WISE. Uh, in fact, uh, David stumbled across um, a presentation that one of our developers gave at the Audio Developers Conference. Uh, it was one of the access points to getting started with creating this bit crushing downsampler. And we also have a one minute WISE. If all you have is one minute to get inspired to create something unique uh, for WISE as a plugin, uh, you can jump over to our YouTube channel and check that out. But again, this idea of creating what you need to help surface the story or the experience that you're contributing to with sound. Uh, thanks, David, for sharing that with the community, and I'm glad to be able to share it here on WISE Up On Air. Uh, next up is Lucas Raymond. Lucas has done an illustration using uh, Wise's spatial audio acoustics offerings, uh, showing off reflections, uh, real-time obstruction occlusion, diffraction, and transmission. Uh, I'll spin a little bit of their video, and you can see for yourself and hear for yourself what that is like. Cool. So that's a, a great illustration. And a lot of times, you know, showing off the technical aspects of what we do, you know, the precision and the fidelity that these kind of techniques of spatial audio, what they can contribute, it's really hard. And so thanks again for uh, surfacing that through this video. Uh, you know, again, Great to have these examples to help us understand, you know, how we might leverage these as part of our own practice, as part of our own games, and uh, you know, again, create these experiences uh, that people can connect with and sink into uh, as part of their play. So, thanks for that. So, this arrives immediately on time uh, as we talk about season, A Letter to the Future. Uh, I'm joined by some special guests who I'd like to introduce to you now. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, keep us posted if there's questions. Uh, and so without further ado, let me welcome folks to the live stream. How's everyone doing? Hey. Hello. 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 It's going great. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Well, I believe we've all arrived here on time sounding and if i can say so looking good over there uh, looks are more important right <laughs> i mean it, it's is when the audio is good it makes everything look better is that the way that goes 
or <laughs> Tootsie. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so the audio for this game is fantastic. I know we're going to dig deep into it and uncover some of the really uh, cool, interesting, technical, and emotional things that you've surfaced. Uh, but let's, let's get some introductions out of the way. And so I hand it off to you, uh, Spencer, to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Spencer Doran. I was the audio director as well as the composer of the score for season A Letter to the Future, which... We can just call season for the purposes of this uh, whole episode, just to keep it uh, a little more in your mouth. Um, and season is a meditative exploration game from Scavenger Studio out of Montreal. Uh, I myself am based in Portland, Oregon in the US, and I worked with the team there. Uh, and you play as a young woman in a secluded village who is sort of tasked with saving the memories from a civilization that's on the verge of collapse, you could say, without giving away too much. There's kind of a cataclysmic event that is in the near future, um, which she is, you know, has to travel through a, a landscape uh, which is completely unfamiliar to her, and document it and discover it for herself. Maybe discover some of her own things about herself in the process. Um, and so, in doing so, she takes photographs as well as makes field recordings. Uh, and then documents all of this in her journal. Um, and I worked exclusively with Vibe Avenue, um, who are here with today, um, who did all of the WISE production on the, on the project. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Great. So uh, on our side, there's Manuel Silva, uh, which is sound designer at Vibe Avenue. He does also integration and some project overseeing. Uh, he did work a lot on season. Uh, here's uh, Effet Dupas, uh, our co-founder, uh, composer, and creative director. And I am Nicolas Viel, uh, production manager. And uh, I do like to make some complicated wise systems. That's like my hobby, yeah. Um, and I can't wait I, to unpack them. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, for this game in particular, though, uh, most of the system uh, were uh, thought of and implemented more by Dylan Escalona, which is not here today. Uh, he went on to other adventures, but we still love him. Uh, and a uh, special mention to uh, Alexandre Chagnard, who did uh, some programming for the project. Uh, he coded the pl the recorder plugin that everybody wants to hear about. So, uh, FX, do you want to introduce Vibe Avenue a little? Uh, yes. So, just a word about Vibe Avenue. We are a um, um, music and audio production company. Uh, so, in Montreal, Canada, uh, we are a team of, of about twenty people, and uh, we are just over ten years old. Uh, we worked on uh, many, many projects by many, many people. Um, and yeah, we try to have a lot of fun and we love interactive audio. Uh, that's what we do. Yeah, and it's been a pleasure to know you for so many years, uh, your sure. role in the community in Montreal, uh, and and yeah, your, your spirit of uh, sharing and involvement. It's been fun to watch Vibe Avenue grow over these last years, so. Congratulations on that, and cool to see the studio. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> great to have that uh, playground for you and the folks <coughs> working over there. So, uh, okay, great. Well, uh, thank you for that. And uh, you know, Spencer, you were giving a short introduction to this game, and I just want to say, uh, you know, I took my time with. Uh, the first few hours of it, and it, you know, there's an understated grace and beauty to the way that the story unfolds, and it really does, uh, it really is told across all of the different mechanisms that we have in games, right? Through interaction, uh, through the storytelling, you know, the narrative itself, and sound is woven in as such a fundamental piece. This is a contemplative game. It is a, a, a thinking and feeling game, if I may say. And it, 
it uh, it feels like it was ripe for uh, for this treatment of sound and music. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, I worked probably the aside from Vibe Avenue, the person I worked the closest with on team was Kevin, the director, um, who had his own sort of vision for the entire way that the story was going to unfold. Which um, through the process of working on it, you know, the sort of scale of the game once we started working with PlayStation just uh, expanded greatly and gave us a lot more opportunities to kind of do some things that we um, were even dreaming of doing in the initial uh, early sessions for the game, which, you know, primarily the, the in-game field recording uh, in the way that it was realized in the final version, it was something we had not even thought as something that would be possible. Um, and a lot of what Kevin did was sort of work these tools back into the writing process. So, uh, I mean, I guess you'll see in playing the game, but you know, when you're doing recordings, it also triggers elements from the story that you're sort of uncovering. And there's this whole sort of new vector for uh, the writing process where uh, the character would record something and then have their own sort of internal monologue, um, which is written down in the journal, which became a whole other sort of space in which the game uh, has sort of emotional resonance and the way that that emotional resonance connects with the sound in the game and the whole thing was very integrated uh, with Kevin and then with also just like the game designers of the whole project uh, as well as Five Avenue of course. Yeah and I love that that interplay was a bi-directional right? Um, right. There's there's the of course the technical piece which we're going to dig into because I mean like microphone in-game recording sounds uh, that's incredible weaving it into the narrative how how clearly it is a part of that storytelling uh through gameplay or through uh the narrative uh really speaks to the collaboration that you had so uh, nice work on that so who's excited to jump into this recorder bit because i can't wait shall we <coughs> sure Great. Yeah, so um, we actually have a couple of uh, in-game uh, videos to just uh, show how it works so that everybody, uh, I think maybe some people here haven't played the game, so, you know, um, just to make sure that everybody knows about it before we start talking about it. Perfect. Music from a trio of performers. The metal, the breeze, and my mind. So that's when you record, and then once you have recorded, you can like, this appears uh, in your journal, and then you can play it back. The actual recording yeah. you did. It's so not. It's, it's pretty fun. simple, but uh, it's actually uh, uh, it was it was pretty complicated to implement. Um, so how does it work uh, in a nutshell? Um, the recorder is, is actually a custom uh, coded plugin. So it was coded in C plus uh, plus directly in Unreal uh, using the Wise API. So what happens is. We record the master output of WISE and then um, the audio file is written in the save file of the game. And uh, to play it back, uh, we actually send this audio to a uh, WISE input uh, plugin. Uh, so we can then mix it back with the rest of the, the soundscape. 
you make it sound simple and <laughs> and at the same time uh you know i know that there's complexities to navigate there uh but i think that one of the key pieces is having that uh all within wise and and part of your mixing structure mixing hierarchy so that as you're capturing it well first of all you're getting what your what the player is actually hearing and directed at uh, and then secondly when it comes back through uh, you're weaving it through the the wise mixing pipeline and you're able to shape it or, or present it just as you would any other sound in the game yeah exactly cool and that uh, that extends to the uh, to the binauralization of that sound as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah, um, like if you play on PS Five with headphones, uh, the sound is um, is actually um, ambisonics. Uh, so you can have a really good feeling of you know where the the sound come from. Um, but yeah, as you say, like the binaurality was really important for us. Uh, and actually, I, I mean, this feature, which is, um, you know, uh, just like that would seem simple. Um, not only was took a really long time to, to really get like this right in this formula of uh, what I just described, uh, recording the, the master output and sending it back to Wise. Uh, quite a long time to figure out, you know, what was the best to to make it work uh, and the other thing is that uh, it became quite the uh -oh, oh we're losing them i think it's possible their cpu is in future of the uh, because we had you know that feature available especially in terms of uh Okay, we're gonna let uh, some of those uh, internet uh, for, things for, for, smooth themselves out a little bit. I noticed uh, it happened once you opened Wise, so it might be a CPU issue, maybe. Interesting. Uh, cool. Hmm. All right, letting the Why internet catch up. Uh, <laughs> I'm. I think. Uh, I think we. Uh, you seem okay now. Cool. All right. Okay, so it's when we switch to whites. All right. Hang with us while we do some technical troubleshooting. Uh, s stay tuned. Just a second.
Okay. And just like that, the magical power of the internet, we're back. Thanks for uh, that. And uh, okay, we're just about to dig in. Cool. We're going to start talking about ambiences. Yeah, well, uh, ambiences are uh, the core of the contemplative aspect of this game. And it complements uh, the recorder machine, the recorder system uh, mechanic tremendously. So since, since uh, the player can uh, record anything they want, uh, we decide to uh, hand place 3D audio instead of custom blueprints. Uh, so that gives us more freedom, artistic freedom, to, to uh, like for instance, for instance you, can, you, you can be in a section of the game and you can have five trees and it's possible that each one has a different sound, different attenuation and uh, we did this with everything, with water, with the river, with the ocean waves, uh, with some insects. Um, I know we will talk later about collectible, but uh, there is one tree in the Caro village that we added uh, some weird birds, magic sounds, and uh, winds, leaves, winds, and, and it's great. It's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a, it's a very nice feature. So, um, uh, so yeah. So in addition to the three D uh, environment, we have two D paths, of course. And uh, they are triggered and maintained by uh, state boxes. What is cool about this uh, is that we have a box per region. So we can control, if we want, we can uh, change uh, audio 3D uh, in a specific region without change the same sound in another region. So that uh, gives us more freedom and to be able to have more contrast and uh, in the environment so uh, yeah you, you can yeah. show a picture you can yeah it's like painting you know uh, you'll yeah. see we have thousands and thousands of uh, 3d audio everywhere there yeah so uh, this means that uh, for a region if like uh, you're in a closer uh, smaller space you can uh, dim diminish the volume of all the trees around you yes. without having a custom 3d sphere for them because you know you're in that room you just use the state and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So it's those little things that you add up over time with your technical pipeline, like how you're making those decisions, like having states for these things, because you know you're going to want to reach for those to tune things on, on a on a case by case basis um, that just sets you up for being able to succeed when you get to that place where you're tuning things emotionally. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's very much a preparation work, meaning that uh, you don't even know you're going to use them, but you might as well have them. Yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so and, uh, it's also a system uh, we, we've been using a lot, uh, like having really making sure that we have, you know, a box for every location, uh, like bigger location and smaller locations. Because it's it's really easy to tweak things with that, you know. If you know exactly where you are and you have state for every place, uh, it's very easy to. Um, if you have sounds a little bit further away that you want to tone down, you, you can do it. You can fake some stuff uh, sometimes, like occlusion, or you know that would be otherwise more difficult to do. So it gives you a lot of things that you can do to kind of fine tune um, yeah. the soundscape, the general soundscape of the the ambiences. I was going to say that the soundscape is really important in this game because not only is it you know part of the active gameplay, but because the player is able to just solely focus in and record and listen directly to the soundscape itself, it was really important to have it feel really alive and not feel flat or not be able to hear any sort of the seams of the loops or anything. So there was a lot of care that kind of went into making sure that when you pulled out the recorder and you were just pointing it at things, you could just listen to them for you know a really long time. And anyone who's done field recording know that knows that's like a lot of it is just sitting there and listening. And we wanted that process to not be something that sort of you know showed its art artificiality or that showed its sort of like uh, you know the seams in its construction. So that you could actually just sit there and listen to the soundscape, and it could be a beautiful experience even without you know uh, the sort of extra narrative aspect aspects of the gameplay. 
Yeah, you don't want to hear the loops. You don't want to hear the repetition, right? Yes, you want exactly. to simulate real life. And and I think one of the things that's that's was really clear from a direction standpoint is this is a game where ambiences are important, right? They're not just uh, they're not just setting or a backdrop, right? There's a level of environmental storytelling going on here that uh, that matters, right? Narratively, uh, but also with regards to immersion, right? Hand placing those 3D emitters, making sure that you're tuning um, the mix across these different areas, right? To fo focus or de-emphasize other other sounds, right, to, to help tell that story. Uh, so it's great to hear how much care you've taken to, to ensure that that all speaks the language of the game. And, and all of this was just done on a really small team, too. You know, we're not like a AAA game that's working with it. Yeah, like, it was basically you know, who you can see in the room, and Dylan and a, and a couple other people. Um, so mm -hmm. we had to do this in a way that was easy to scale uh, without, you know, having to spend a lot of uh, hours, <laughs> you know, on an employee level yeah. working on it. Yeah, and uh, we are lucky to have somebody as patient as Manu to, to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it was time consuming, you know, but, but on the other hand, we have the freedom, artistic freedom to create like different kind of stuff, different insects, different birds, different kind of trees and, or winds. So it was pretty cool. It was super cool to do that, yeah. Yeah, it's and it's so contrasting with other games that are more like uh, bloody and yeah. gory and stuff. So this yeah. was like totally another focus. Uh, yeah, it was very cool to do. And there is something that Nico said a long time ago. Uh, we were looking for silence without silence. So uh, it was pretty important uh, to find a, a good balance of that. Uh, we have s everywhere we have sounds, but they are not annoying. The music is just perfect. So. You know, I'm coming. I'm. I'm do, I, I, I have doing games like really uh, violence games, if you want, <laughs> if you will. So, start work in season was like change my mind. Like, okay, I need to work, change all my, my my mindset to work in this game because uh, it, it should be all balanced, quiet, but with no silence. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I'm guessing that that process of implementation was also kind of meditative, right? You could kind of just soak in the ambiences and, uh, you know, get everything sounding the way you like and, and then yeah. just, okay, yeah, move on. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. But again, it was the, in my mind, you can achieve that state uh, when you're authoring, if you've got your tools, processes, and pipeline in place. Like, if you're not yes. fighting against your workflow, then you can enjoy that process, and it does sound like you're able to achieve that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah and uh, why it was super important for this? Uh, I mean, because obviously uh, this could lead to a lot of performance issues, like, you know, this kind of approach. So, you know, being able to really work on the um, prior priorities and, um, yeah, uh, voice stacking, you know, really controlling the number of voices that we wanted to have at the same time. Uh, yeah. Like all this, all the optimization part that came with this uh, was also a lot of work. But I think we, you know, with WISE, we had the tools to, to do it well and it works. Yeah, and so you had other concerns gameplay-wise that would come up on occasion when it came to the more narrative aspects. Um, but you didn't have to worry about a firefight breaking out and, uh, and crushing your, your voice limits, you know. So you had the luxury to, to tune that for, you know, per performance yeah. without the, the worry about it being destroyed at a moment's notice by gameplay. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's uh that's it's good. Nice luxury. Um so besides, you know, being able to record uh virtually everything that is in the soundscape, we do have some very specific um 
I would say audio uh, emitters that are linked to you know the narration and the story. So we call them keepsakes or uh, collectibles. Uh, and Spencer, I don't know if you if you want to say a few words about that because you know this is something that was really uh, I think thought from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean the way that we were going to integrate this into the story was something that sort of you know we did a lot of workshopping on and a lot of kind of experimentation to sort of land where we finally did because you know what was possible on the audio side and what was possible on the narrative side is things that had to be scaled up kind of together in order for it to work. So um, kind of. Also, the same thing that was happening at the same time as we were working on this audio system is they were sort of redesigning the way that the journaling system worked. So the two had to sort of work in tandem really well and like how the audio is gonna be called back within that journaling system sort of had a lot of, um, it gave us a lot of dependencies on that. So we sort of had to re rewrite the, the whole system kind of multiple times as the way that we sort of even approached um, the narrative sort of shifted. And the collectibles were sort of what ended up being like the most crucial aspect of the recording, which was that there were, uh, you know, not, I mean, this was not just on the audio level, it was true for photographs too, where certain things, if they're in your sort of camera purview, when you take photos of them, it triggers these sort of um, poetic lines that the main character um, writes in her journal and speaks aloud. And so this is also true of the audio. So if the audio is within the right, I'm gonna, they'll explain kind of how this works. Um, uh, if the specific sounds that are deemed important in the narrative are within the recording that you make, it triggers these same sort of things that you can then place within your journal. You can place the sounds themselves. You can place the sort of narration lines written uh, as well. So, and sort of what we deemed as being important was, you know, at first we started out we kind of working in both directions where they asked me what sort of sounds I would like to have in the world that would be important. And then they also created, you know, narratives that had objects which would emit sound. So the design of what these sounds even were was sort of coming from both ends. So a lot of the things that you see in the game, which are like um, automatic instruments or sort of like proto sound art kind of things like wind harps or like the organ that's played by the air which you sort of see in the background of this image um, those are all things that I sort of came up with and we just made like a master list of all these sort of things that we wanted to have in the game and then sort of ran it by the various departments of like oh do we have enough bandwidth on the art team to make something you know or in the animation side can it be animated in these sort of ways so we there was kind of even more things that we had in our scope that, you know, just based on time and budget, we just had to scale down to what we could fit in the game, we could fit in the landscape. So it sort of also became part of the way that the level designers did um, the level design because they would have to place these sort of specific <coughs> objects in places that were easy to record or easy to photograph. Uh, and like the, uh, the organ that you see in the background there sort of had probably like four different places that we tried it out before we found the one that worked. Um, and yeah, maybe you guys could talk a little more about the all those sort of um, decisions that we had to make in how to prioritize what did get recorded, what didn't get recorded, how these things sort of are mixed in the sound mix. Yeah, yeah, for for sure, there was some happy accidents too. Like uh, we we start populating the map with sound, and then uh, it turns out that uh, the design team really likes one of the sounds we put somewhere. <laughs> For instance, at some point in the game, we won't spoil anything, but there's a character that's uh, sleeping, and uh, I think it's Manu that uh, did the, the, the integration, put uh, a very cool snoring sound, and then, uh, of course, uh, the writing team and everything wanted to have it as a collectible, because <laughs> it was so funny. So, uh, yeah, there's happy accidents like that, uh, or... Um, do you have a, another one uh, in mind? I mean, like, there's some wins that weren't, like, necessarily thought of as uh, recordables, but then turns out it was very cool. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this was sort of just trial and error based on playtesting, too, where, like, sort of the original iteration of the recorder, you could only record the things that we deemed as collectibles or keepsakes. Like, when you tried to record something where there was no sound, or no important, quote-unquote, sound, like just pointing at the wind, 
you know, you'd get a recording, but it wouldn't show up in your journal. You couldn't recall it back. And we had a lot of players, I mean, myself too, who were like, I want to just be able to record the wind and have it in my journal and listen back to it as part of my, um, my own version of the story. So we sort of had, we rewrote the design of the whole audio system kind of around feedback like that that we got. It's fantastic, like the collaborative pieces that I'm hearing weaving through the team across all the disciplines, you know, having to having to be aware of sound, its influence and its, you know, storytelling possibility, um, you know, sounds like it was a, a very um, deliberate piece of the development pipeline, not just between, you know, yourselves, but also across all the other teams as well. Did that just happen? Was that just magic? Was was there some intention of that from the start? Well, it was a lot of like, we put together sort of a strike team uh, from people from all the different departments, uh, just to sort of create different gyms, uh, sort of in the in Wise and in Unreal and just sort of test out what worked and didn't work. Uh, and, you know, ideas would come from all the different sort of departments about what could be a good way to do it, what could be things that could be improved. You know, there's a lot of variables that went into um, fine tuning this and it took, you know, a pretty fair amount of the production time um, to sort of get it right. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, we're very happy with what it landed on. So I'm glad that we, we took the time to do that. And you say Jim, and what I'm imagining is just a gray boxed uh, level that someone starts riffing on a model or dropping in a sound early emitter. On, yeah, early on it would be like that, where we'd have a sort of little collection of objects um, that would be um, sound emitting things, and we'd sort of test out, you know, have some ambience in the background as well. Uh, and then, you know, as we went on, just the gyms just became regions of the maps. Like, oh, we'd go to this part of Tiang Valley and try to test out things there. Or the one that was our main sort of um, test case was um, the plaza that you sort of see in the background there. Um, and like a lot of those, because we had to balance not only all the amices, but there was sort of one thing that was really tricky was getting the, the musical um, uh, collectibles not be mistaken for part of the score. Uh, because you know the score itself is very abstract and sort of floats in and out in this way that feels very natural to the Foley design. So, you know, when we had something like that pipe organ playing, it, a lot of people would just walk by it, um, not realizing that it was emitting sound uh, because they thought that it was part of the score. So there was all these sort of like test cases that we had to sort of work through to get our, uh, to sort of land at what um, was the right approach. Gotcha. And that's also the spot where there's uh, the tree that uh, Manu was talking exactly. about earlier. Yeah, exactly. The very special tree, yeah. Cool. Uh, question coming in from the chat on this. Uh, and is there a Wilhelm scream buried in there somewhere? <laughs> I uh, think so. Oh, no. Uh, we should have, eh? The mm. question is for Spencer. You know, did you have total freedom um, with how you were... Uh, you know, working with Vibe Avenue to do, you know, how did that collaboration between the two of you work? Um, you know, how did you balance maybe your your vision or direction against uh, the creativity and and how did that uh, how did that work? I mean, it worked very natural. I mean, it, it helped that they had actually done all the sound design for the demo version of the game, which was completed before I came on the project. Um, so that there was a demo version of the game that they took to Pax East, I think in 2019, I want to say. Um, mm -hmm. I came on the project in June of 2020, sort of deep in the beginning of the kind of pandemic uh, lockdown. So uh, what I was sort of given starting out was basically this uh, sort of rudimentary version of what we landed up with, the bike mechanics, um, some of the level uh, soundscape design, some things like that. So when um, the game got picked up by... Sony in, I want to say, towards the end of 2020, um, they were the natural person to bring uh, back onto the project, given that they already had familiarity with it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, as far as like what the constraints were, I mean, our only constraints were, you know, time and budget. Um, I mean, 
we certainly had enough freedom to experiment, which was something that, I mean, I think is crucial in any sort of kind of project uh, to sort of land on things that do work, things that don't work. I mean, eventually we had to rein it in and make some hard decisions down the line, but, you know, uh, experimenting with them was, was very easy. Even though, you know, obviously I was here on the West Coast, they were there in Montreal, um, everything was done remotely. Uh, sometimes it's a little tricky when you're working um, directly in the engine like that, um, but there was, you know, a lot of working on Discord and screen sharing and um, just doing live stream kind of sessions and working through all the kinks, um, but yeah, it worked out, it worked great. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, like uh, Spencer had great mm -hmm. vision, and then uh, we were uh, more like there to like say, okay, th this is easily doable. This takes more work. So where should we focus our resources? Mm -hmm. And then like uh, at some point, we uh, we got the ball rolling. Like uh, we knew what Spencer was looking for. So uh, like yeah, that's it. So it was pretty uh, pretty cool collabor collaboration for sure. Thanks. Started to. Sh share a brain at some point uh, exactly yeah. yeah i mean before the we brought them back onto the project i kind of made a big presentation to the whole team where i sort of you know, sketched out a lot of my philosophy behind a lot of this stuff and um there was another piece that we wrote for a sound effect uh which is online you can read that has talks about some of that but um you know my approach to it is very sort of from outside of the perspective of working in WISE and sort of they were the WISE experts. I had more of like the, you know, philosophical or musical um, direction that uh, sort of helped us land on what we wanted this game to sort of feel like because a lot of it is just about getting the feeling right. You know, the technicalities um, you can work on endlessly, but at the end of the day, it's, it's what you want the sort of emotional experience of the player to be is what you're really focusing on. So that's what was what my goal was, was to sort of hone in on that. It's true, when, uh, when the technical pieces uh, can just dissolve into the background and you're left with that emotional resonance of the experience, I think it really shines. And that's a, uh, that's a tough thing to accomplish. So well done on that. You said uh, a word earlier that I want to bring back into the conversation, wind harps. Oh, yeah. Or uh, alien harp, you could also say, is the ancient Greek uh, version of it. Okay, and so what is it? Um, so, I mean, the history of these goes really far back, you know, thousands of years. Uh, in the game, the game version is sort of based on my experiences in in San Francisco. There's the South San Francisco wind harp. If you're ever in San Francisco, this is a great kind of destinational uh, touristy kind of thing to do because it's more in the industrial area, but um, in San Francisco, it's really tall. It's about maybe three or four stories tall, but um, there are sort of uh, tubes of air that the wind travels through and are tuned in a specific way uh, that the air passing through them causes like, uh, you know, tonal qualities to sort of arise. Um, and, you know, the one in our game is, uh, is a little more tonal than some of them are, but uh, in some cases, it's also just a series of strings that are um, played by the air, or like the, sort of like the classic Greek alien harp is like a, basically just a, a harp that's placed in uh, you know a very windy landscape that air passes through. So the design of that sort of almost also influenced the score in a way where we were wanting to have, especially in Tang Valley, which is where sort of like the big open world part of the map. Um, we wanted, or I mean, the writer and I sort of wanted there to be a sort of mystical quality, which the score sort of uses uh, aspects from the Foley design to sort of trigger itself. So there's parts of the winds that are blowing through um, the natural environment, which sort of are doubled in the way that the score is realized within WISE. And yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit of that, uh, Nicola. I don't know if you're able to pull up anything <coughs> like that yeah, there, sure. but um, we can go uh, way <laughs> further. Want to switch there. <laughs> so, like uh, a big. No, it's still working. Um, mm, it's 
So for Tingali, Tingali for, for instance. instance. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, like, did I jump too far ahead in your presentation here? And bring oh, no, up? it's cool. Uh, okay. We can jump around. It's uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so in Ting Valley, for instance, uh, we had some big regions. Uh, and those regions, uh, I didn't. I don't have a screenshot of it, but it's more like, uh, like uh, Spencer was saying, um, the music emanates from one particular spot, but then uh, it's it's like uh, it entices you to go in a certain direction because it's a, a huge sphere, and then there's a, a an important spot at the middle. So, like you can see on those curves, uh, those are like both one sound uh well a different layer of a sound i can go play it back if you want uh and it's like uh the closer you get the more one layer goes down uh, like you can see here when you're close the layers out and then the further you get the the more you have directional directionality so the more you know it's which way you have to go uh yeah Oh, I love a creative attenuation curve. Uh, there's <laughs> so much potential, and you're really leveraging that opportunity that's okay. there. So yeah. Try to switch to wise. Cool. Nothing broke. Nothing broke. See, I, I, so far so good. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm, oh, and oh, oh. no. <laughs> Game over. Uh, but we we lost you. No. Yeah, maybe just uh, we might not have to. Uh, uh, if I s and if I switch back to the presentation, you hear us, right? <laughs> yes. Now? Yeah. It's I think back. it's just uh, wise is not going to happen, unfortunately. Huh? For audio kinetic. Fascinating. So it's really wise. Wow. So now now it's broken again. Uh, uh, did did it break again? It seems to be yep. working. Oh no. Oh, it's yep. Uh. And I okay, so uh, um, no audio example for you. Though. <laughs> wow, wow. Uh, we, we could just uh, stop the screen sharing and you could try that. Uh, yeah. I'll okay. Cool. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're going to try it. You're still here. You're still here. Right. Oh, but if I share wise, uh, like it's That's the attenuation. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it works. That's great. Uh, cool. So, cool. Um, so I'll just play the two uh, blend containers at the same time, and you'll hear some stuff. Hopefully. So, uh, the further you get from them, you start hearing the mallets. And then it slowly f fades out. By the way, uh, the infinite at attenuation curve, that's a trick because uh, when you stop those segments, uh, as you can see right here, it's uh, a few segments. Uh, I'll stop the. Cool. It's a few segments of different uh, lengths. Uh, but when you leave the big sphere, we wanted it to be able to finish and not just cut out. So uh, it's set up uh, on breaks, and uh, since the attenuation is infinite, well, if you bike ride uh, to the other side of the map, you'll continue hearing it until it ends. Yeah, and then a big part of the design of this was that all of these different um, layers were abstract enough that could be kind of collaged and overlap with each other in a way um, that didn't create any sort of uh, rhythmic dissonance or harmonic dissonance. So, uh, or melodic dissonance, you know, like everything is done in the same key, uh, in the key of C, actually. So it's really easy to sort of take all these different 
areas of the map and have as you sort of traverse through them like, you know there's no hard stops or stops like he's saying like you're sort of blending from one area into the other area and in this very sort of way that you maybe don't even notice if you're not paying really close attention to what's happening exactly and since the sphere overlap uh, you can be um, directed to one side or another depending on what texture you're following I don't know if anybody played it like that, but it's cool to do. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I, well, and I love the technical trick that you explained, and then even you, Spencer, and your retelling of it uh, from the from the music side of it. You know, it just blends seamlessly, right? And whether you whether you know it or not, the care that you've taken to ensure that that transition is you know, sustains and continues to carry the emotion of whatever is happening, um, yeah, really speaks to the level of care that sound is, and music have gotten for this title. And it's a cool trick. And there's a even really literal version of there being these sort of like, when you're going down from um, Estelle is the main character, from Estelle's village and you're just sort of descending down into the valley, there's this area where the music from her village and then the music from the valley sort of start to kind of crossfade with each other. Uh, and they have sort of different, they're in the same key, but they have different tonal centers. So you sort of, uh, you can feel this sort of overlap going from one mode to another mode, which is, you know, both like a landscape uh, sort of shifting, but also sort of like the musical background to it shifting. So if you, if you go that, road really fast and just bike down really quickly you might not notice it but if you sort of slowly take your time you can sort of see the way that there's different points at which the two uh you could call them like musical biomes the two musical biomes kind of overlap in the same way that like going from one uh sort of environmental audio biome overlaps with the other one so we wanted there to be like uh these sort of subtle things that you could pick up on if you're sort of closely listening and, and mirroring her emotional journey too, from uh, where she was to where she's going, you know, the music juxtaposition as that transitions, uh, again, all in support of this storytelling side of things. Uh, was the music synced or are they free floating and they can just kind of overlap at whim? There's definitely some elements that are synced. Uh, going from that environment to the other environment, I feel like uh, it's the main backing is sort of like a string quartet that uh, overlays between the two of them. Uh, and in the earlier part, you're sort of in a, uh, there's like a piano piece that's in a major scale. And then as you descend down, there's these sort of interlocking uh, mallet percussion sections that come in in more of a pentatonic um, kind of Javanese slash Okinawan kind of uh, s scale that uh, as you're sort of going between the two of them, it, you can sort of feel like they're interlocked rhythmically, but they're not really. It's The piano playing is so abstract, and then the string quartet it does not have like a really uh, defined uh, pulse to it. So it's all sort of meant to sound as if it could go together, but, you know, not. Uh, it's not technically interlocking. But, you know, all those uh, those rhythmic... Uh, sort of mallet sections are interlocking. So these sort of like little pools of things that interlocked that overlap with pools of things that don't, that sort of all sound natural together. So yeah, like the first part is synced together and the second part is synced together, but the buffer between them, since it was like uh, less rhythmic, we didn't need it, it to be synced. But uh, I think uh, the further you go into the bike ride, the more the there is uh, different percussions. Uh, like I think in the tunnel, there's a different percussion percussion than then when you're in the sort of post office, I guess. Right. Uh, all of this. So so yeah, those parts are uh, do have to be synced together, but yeah. All of this gets really tricky when it comes time to put out the soundtrack album, because <laughs> <laughs> then you have to sort of create this sort of, uh, you know, you have to take a very living, very 3D, very spatialized. Uh, Sort of musical experience and just bounce it down to stereo two tracks fixed time you know replayable on an lp so that was like a very long process for me was sort of creating this idealized version of that um that shift between the two environments yeah i mean essentially this 
what you're saying is the the game's soundtrack writes itself when you're playing the game, mm -hmm. uh, but the game's soundtrack outside of the game needs to be performed as if you were playing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, this is sort of a problem that I've sort of had in my own musical releases as well, where when you're using like a lot of either generative or sort of aleatoric elements, uh, when it comes time to actually freeze those and make a sort of piece that's released, you know, on like a, you know, an LP or on a streaming service or on a CD, what have you, um, you have to kind of, basically what I end up doing is rendering like, I mean, maybe like 50 versions of it and choosing the one that I like best. And I had to do some of that making this soundtrack uh, release as well. Cool. As the soundtrack is out? The soundtrack is out digitally. I mean, can we get a link to that in the chat? Is that you bet. possible? How, how can I send that to you? Mm, uh, we'll drop it on, in there. On RVNG and International or um, INTL, the LPs should be arriving ideally this fall. LP production pipeline is very um, uh, hard to pin down in, in 2023, but. Uh, the album is out digitally on Bandcamp. There is a, another version on Steam which has sort of different versions of all these sort of things. The RVNG uh, release is the sort of idealized versions of everything collaged. Um, the Steam version is sort of all the tracks separated. So as we're talking about these different uh, areas of the maps bleeding into each other, instead it's just each individual section by itself. So there's more tracks, um, but less of a experience, ex listening experience that sort of emulates the gameplay. Awesome. Uh, we have the link there in the chat to the band camps awesome. uh, for folks to jump in and uh, vibe on that. Get it? Vibe on that soundtrack. Mm -hmm. See what it did? <laughs> uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, the question coming in from the chat transitioning between these sections uh are they are they uh trigger volumes like how do you know when you're leaving one and entering another what was the behind the scenes on that yeah so for ting valley uh of them would be uh like on the point of interest and for sure, some section we cheated a little, uh, uh, mm -hmm. meaning that some sections you don't necessarily want to hear music from another one. But uh, the system of the 2D, uh, 2D pads of uh, environments saved us because we had states. So we could just remove the music for those sections. Um, I have in my mind the farm. Uh, right. with the cows yeah. and stuff so so that had like its own atmosphere so we didn't necessarily want everything else to blend into it there's one tricky aspect which was that when uh, not to give away too much but uh, there's a state when it's time to sort of leave the main area mm. um, it's nightfall has happened the players are supposed to be kind of um, not rushed but you're sort of implied that you, it's time for you to move on and when that happens, there's another sort of musical theme that comes in, which is the rhythmic, which meant that we had to make sure that we killed all the other um, sort of environmentally placed musical cues that had rhythms in them um, so that there wasn't any sort of clash um, because it would have been a little too complicated to tempo sync everything because um, it was two different tempos, uh, one more languid, one more hurried and sort of uh, not rushed, but more uh, steady paced. Um, so yeah, we had to come up with a system for that. Um, and then also, the, as far as trigger <clears> points goes, there was a lot of things where we wanted to be able to be in between the two musical states. Like a good example is going from the plaza and sort of descending down into the field. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sort of abstract version of the piece and then a more concrete version of the piece that you're sort of blending between. Uh, and we didn't want that to happen sort of too immediately, we want it to be sort of gradual, so there's multiple points in which uh, you get, it's almost like, I think of a lot as a crossfader, just because I come from, uh, you know, used to DJ and, and do a lot of, you know, mixing, so you're sort of having a crossfader that's between the A point and the B point, 
you don't want it to just slide all the way over to the B point. You want it to be more gradual. So there's sort of different spaces in between where you're sort of getting like, you know, 80% of one layer and 20% of another, or 60% of one layer and 40% of another until you're all the way 100% to the other direction. And turns out the easy way to do this, because uh, at first uh, in the mock-up it was just spheres uh, mm -hmm. in Unreal, but uh, it was hard to tempo sync correctly and stuff. So the way, and it didn't really need it to be in, tr in 3D. So the way we did it is like, uh, you have an RTPC between the, the two songs and it's totally a crossfade. Uh, so you have uh, very, uh, like dozens of triggers uh, on your path. So each time you cross a trigger, it slowly fades uh, the, the RTPC. So it, it gives out uh, exactly the result that uh, Spencer was looking for. Yeah, I mean, I made yeah. the original mockups for this just in Unreal, just by placing sort of spheres as audio emitters, not as, you know, like a 2D uh, procedural sort of thing in Wise. So like a lot of what the Nicola was trying to do was basically just recreate my really kind of ham-fisted uh, <laughs> DIY way of trying to throw this idea together. Yeah, and, and it, it's that kind of progression that again, the technology is transparent. You don't see it or hear it. Really, uh, if you really know what you're listening for, you might hear it. <laughs> yeah, that that's hard too, because uh, yeah. when you have a clear idea in your mind and you know what you're listening to, uh, it's harder to sell it, because uh, anybody listening to it would go like, it's great, it sounds really cool, but it, when yeah. you know Oh, it's going to it change right here. Mm -hmm. You have to like, yeah. It's sort of like when you've worked a lot in Melodyne or like any sort of like auto-tune uh, sort of software and then you listen to the radio, you're like, oh, you can sort of hear where they're pushing the artifacts or like you sort of are poisoned with this ear of, poisoned with this knowledge of, of how the system works. So, I mean, maybe some people would notice this in uh, playing the game. I don't think so, though. Yeah. Well, and and again, back to this idea that you press play on the soundtrack and I think naturally you listen until it stops. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the game, you have locomotion, you have movement. At any point during that composition, at any point along that path, you could stop. You can stop moving, right. and the music doesn't stop with you. It needs to continue, and it needs con to continue at at that uh, at the place where it is, right? And I guess in jazz they might call it vamp. It needs to vamp in mm. that state uh, while you're there, whether you've got your recorder out and are are capturing some wind, or whether you just decided to you know, get off your bike and, uh, and take in the view, right? And this is back to that idea that, uh, you know, the gameplay and how music and sound unfolds is dramatically different than, uh, than the pre-recorded soundtrack. Yeah, and I, I think the use of the recorder also uh, made it so that the music had to go in a certain aesthetic because each time you get the recorder out, the music fades out. So you do need to be able to like have those continuous music pads and stuff, but not be like too intense or anything. Yeah, and, and we can talk about that a bit more because like the mixing part was really, really, really uh, essential. So if I can switch back to yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, okay. So I don't need to do that, right? Yeah, exactly. So it didn't break. Yeah, uh, and you want to go to what, what part? Uh, this one. So where we were. Um, I can put it full screen. Again. Why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I think we can keep it. Like yeah. Um, because so we actually uh, once we had the system for the recorder in place, um, like the plugin was coded and everything was was working. Um, you know, then the, the mixing aspect actually uh, is where uh, every every the, the magic really happened because uh, as 
Spencer and Manu and Nico said, like, we really wanted to recreate a certain feeling. And if you have already done some field recording, I'm guessing uh, most people uh, in this uh, live stream have, uh, you know that uh, listening through headphones, um, you know, to what, what a microphone hears is very different than just listening to your ears, you know. Uh, they said the ears um, listen and the microphone hears. So when you put your headphones, uh, suddenly, um, like the way you hear is really different. Uh, there is no selective hearing like when you're just, you know, listening with your ears. So we, we really wanted to kind of recreate uh, this feeling. And so when it comes to the, the recorder um, that you basically use all the time because you're looking for, you know, sounds, uh, important sounds for um, progressing the, the story and the narration, uh, there are three actually diff three different states. Um, so you have the normal state, which is uh, you don't have the recorder in hand, you're just walking around or biking around. Uh, then you have a different state when you actually um, take the recorder in hand and so put your headphones in the game uh, and then the third state is when you are actually recording um, yeah and so everything works with uh, what we call the the focus but the focus is not the um, like the wise focus uh, basic parameter. I think Nico can, can tell you a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, we, we wanted to overcomplicate it and <laughs> so that nobody understands when we do a talk. So we decided to <laughs> use the same word, but not the same definition. So uh, in wise, if you have a focus on an attenuation, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Demi, but uh, it's like uh, how much uh, speakers bleed into each other's. Yep. Uh, from an yep. emitter. Focus in the stereo field. Yeah, exactly. But in season, what we did uh, is that it's actually the cone attenuation, uh, the listener cone attenuation. So when you're uh, going around uh, in the game, the curve is like here. Uh, yeah, that's right. So everything on your sound field you hear everything behind you and stuff but everything is at a bit of a lower volume and low pass and high pass uh that that what makes it like a pastel like it's it's nothing aggressive nothing uh stands out too much and then when you get your recorder out uh it's it's like if your field of vision uh zoomed in but for your ears so you just hear what's in front of you louder and then uh, not low pass or anything. So that's how uh, we achieved that, that feeling. Uh, Spencer, I know you had uh, some reference. Uh, oh yeah, so there's this, yeah. uh, a, a lot of my sort of philosophy about this game kind of goes back to um, this guy, Armory Schaefer, who sort of created the concept of the soundscape. I mean, this is maybe too long winded to go um, how far are we in the stream already, but um, there was a, in Vancouver, there was a group called the World Soundscape Project, which this other composer, Hildegard Westerkamp, was part of. And she has a sort of sound piece in which she's going to Vancouver Bay, and um, there's a really specific part of the beach there where you can uh, hear the barnacles um, sort of hissing as the water recedes from them. Um, but because Vancouver Bay, Bay is so close to the city, you're also hearing sort of the noise of the city off in the distance. You hear sort of like this, you know, the white noise that a, a city sort of emanates. So she sort of <coughs> made the sound piece in which she narrates the aspect of sort of focusing in on the sound of the barnacle and sort of literally low passing and high passing out all the other sounds that aren't in this frequency range just to focus on one, these one like little tiny sound. Um, and that's sort of what we ended up doing you know, with this process we're talking about here where we're sort of low passing things, high passing things that aren't in your direct purview because we really wanted the feeling of getting this intimate uh, kind of relationship with the sound that you're recording and sort of like zooming in or like things getting even more clarity than when you're just listening to them, which is, you know, if you've ever played around with a microphone, you're sort of pointing it around with a really hot mic, you're sort of hearing something when you're wearing headphones, you're hearing different than what your ears would be hearing if you're just standing in a 
in the space itself. You're hearing the microphone's experience of the sound and not your own. So we really wanted to focus in on these things that you're aiming at um, in the same way that like with the camera, you have depth of field, you can sort of focus in on this object that's in the foreground and everything else in the background is sort of blurry. Uh, and that's kind of what we did uh, with this whole process. And this took a lot of workshopping Tweaking, and a yeah. lot of um, testing, a lot of like me writing really long <laughs> Google Docs, giving notes about what should or shouldn't be uh, in high pass, low pass, all that sort of thing, like what percentage of it should be high pass at this state, like all these sort of things. Um, and you know, I think what it, we land, ended up with is something that it really feels like using a microphone from, from people that I've talked to who are uh, really picky about that sort of thing. Yeah, and and f from the technical perspective, you have a focus game parameter, you're binding that to the azimuth built-in game parameter with some interpolation uh, or? Cone attenuation. Cone attenuation. The listener cone attenuation. Yeah, okay, so that, that built-in game parameter, you're just uh, passing that to a focus game parameter and then using that to pull the strings on some RTPCs. Uh, and uh, what kind of things are having that treatment applied? Are you at the like entire ambient bus? Are you making choices about which layers of the ambient are having that treatment? Um, uh, it's pretty much everything that's uh, in a 3D environment. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, like the music is no longer present, so you have a state when you go into recorder mode. And uh, the 2D ambiences are also lowered so that it gives you that feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, oh, yeah. a, there's a collectibles bus, so basically everything that's not in the collectibles bus ah, gotcha. gets affected. Yeah, yeah so, so yeah, basically, uh, I thought it was written on a slide, but uh, I, I can find it. But um, yeah, whenever you, you, you draw your recorder, so you have it in hand, uh, suddenly all the, first of all, the music uh, is muted. Um, like the the music pads, um, and then all the two D ambiences are also lowered a lot. Um, and if there is a keepsake, um, like the volume of the keepsake is really really uh, louder, so you can really hear it clearly. Uh, and so all the sounds in the three D environment, as uh, Nico said, become really more uh, focused. Like you know, the cone attenuation is. Um, um, is reduced, so you hear really what's in front of you, except for the keepsakes, because we wanted to the player to be able to hear them, even if they didn't face them. So there is really a specific treatment for keepsakes. Um, so the keepsakes, on the contrary, you can hear them really all around you, um, still with attenuation, so you can really like you know look for them True. and point them. Uh, but it's a, it's really a different treatment than the rest of the 3D elements. It got tricky too because sometimes there would be two of them in your your purview, mm -hmm. and then we had to make one of them be the one that was being recorded because the character says a line about a specific thing that they're recording. If there's two things in their purview. We sort of had to give priority over one versus the other, so there had to be sort of an algorithm written that would sort of determine based on your distance, like percentage-wise, which was closer, which was you know not based just on like depth, but also uh, sort of like left and right, like things like that. Yeah, for sure. It makes me think that every collectible had two spheres. So there was an audio sphere, uh, so that like it triggers the sound and then with the attenuation, but there was a second sphere that was like uh, the sphere of uh, from which distance can you actually record it? So from which distance do you hear it enough so that uh, right. when you re record it, it triggers the line. So exactly with the priority on top of that. Yeah. Because if you're like really far away some, from something like, say you just barely hear the um, the wind organ thing you see in the image there, like it's just sort of on the edge of your perception. When you're recording it, you don't want that to be the thing that the character is talking about because you might not even notice it when you're listening to it. You want it to be once you're in a range where it feels like it's in the center of your attention. And that was another thing that took a lot of kind of play testing to figure out what felt natural. Mm. And uh, so also when you have the recorder in hand, um, you, there is an EQ that is applied and a little bit of distortion because obviously, you know, it's not necessarily a super high, uh, 
high f fidelity recorder, so I wanted to you know give it a bit of a vintage vibe. Um, but if you press record um, this distortion and uh, changes, uh, there is also compressor. Uh, so when you press record, no more distortion and the EQ and compressor changes because uh, when you press record, then you are actually recording, you know, the output of wise into a wave file. So, you know, we wanted to have something very clean uh, as an output. Um, so yeah, so these are really three very different mixing states. And uh, regarding the, the keepsakes, uh, they also have a different behavior before uh, they are recorded and after they are recorded. Because before uh, we wanted them to stand out, so you know the player can really uh, figure out, oh, you know this is an important sound. Uh, but after they have been recorded, you know they they don't need to take as much space in the in the soundscape. So basically, once they are recorded, uh, the state changes and they are back to being more normal 3D elements. Um, so how it works is that uh, the frequency of the sounds. Uh, is reduced. So, for example, uh, if you have a cricket, uh, you might hear it a lot before it's recorded, like uh, you know, like very often. But once you have recorded it, then you hear it just from time to time. So, like technically, it's really having the blend, the, the random container, um, you know, on. Um, and like trigger rate and the trigger rate is changing uh, with the state if it is before being recorded or after. Uh, and also the volume is lower. Uh, it doesn't chain the, the rest of the 3D elements like the keepsake do before being recorded. Uh, so basically it really blends more into the rest of the 3D soundscape. And so now you can just continue to hunt for the other ones. And this is like going back to wanting to draw the player's attention to certain things without them being obnoxious or like without them sort of disrupting the more meditative nature of the gameplay and that sort of thing. Well, it's a lot of care into trying to ensure that these, you know, systems for presentation are, again, getting out of the way, right? You're taking a lot of care to make sure that the experience is representative of what we as sound people know from, you know, putting a pair of headphones on and heading out with a microphone, uh, and you're trying to preserve the immersion uh, while also, you know, ensuring that they take notice of these important things. Um, and yeah, again, great, uh, great technology behind the scenes to try and make sure that these things flow smoothly and seamlessly as part of the player experience without exposing themselves, right? And uh, another way we, we kind of uh, give clues to the, the player is through haptic feedback. Um, so we had the, the sounds and uh, so especially the keepsakes uh, routed to um, a wise motion bus. So whenever you are close to uh, a collectible uh, and you take your recorder in hand, uh, your controller will vibrate, you know. And so it also has an attenuation curve. So the closer you are, the more it vibrates. Um, and uh, it is especially um, interesting on PS5 because, you know, we have all that uh, more sophisticated haptic feedback. So the controller also vibrates in the direction where the sound is. So, for example, if uh, the sound is to your left, then the left part of the controller will vibrate more. So you can also aim uh, at, you know, the, the important sound in the environment uh, with the help of the haptic feedback. Also, when you record the sound, you get the sound as haptic feedback in the controller to sort of add to the sort of tactile nature of experiencing the sound. But also, <coughs> there's this degree of, you know, obviously this game is very focused on the audio experience, which, you know, for accessibility reasons, you know, that's not perceivable by everyone. So we wanted the player to be able to sort of experience the sound, even if they're not able to hear it, 
So uh, something happens when you're recording where we take the actual collectible audio and route it. So the way the PS5 um, controller works is it's basically like an audio bus that takes frequencies from 500 hertz and below. So if you pitch things down into sort of like the vibration range, uh, you can feel all these sounds like the cricket chirping, you feel it buzzing when the chirps happen. And, you know, this took some sort of trial and error. Uh, and then, you know, in sort of degrees of intensity, how hard we wanted it to be and everything. But uh, a lot of the sounds, you can feel them as well as listen to them. Right, operating on all the different levels of sensation that we have at our disposal, right? And this idea that you're using audio to drive that, I think, is so key because uh, because the uh, care you've put into the sound, right, is not the kind of thing that you would want to recreate outside of the audio system. So being able to just leverage it as part of your tool set send that audio stream and even get positional information uh, is just a great way to not only lend itself to the sound, but as you were mentioning, help guide people uh, with their senses. Hmm. Yeah, I think it really brings a lot to the experience, you know, being able to feel like uh, the, the sounds. Uh, but uh, the, this part also took a lot of work because uh, some sounds are, are just not working, you know, as is when you send them to the motion bus. They just don't produce, you know, uh, interesting vibration or, you know, the vibration uh, actually don't feel like, you know, what you are hearing. So some sounds it was OK, you know, we send them to the bus and OK, the result was was good. Uh, some of them we had to really tweak to make the controller vibrate uh, in the way we wanted, we wanted it to. Which is basically uh, just so pitching them down for the most part. Yeah, or you know, adding distortion or EQ to emphasize uh, the, the frequencies that were working. Um, and finally, some sounds we just didn't manage to get a good result. So in this case, we, we designed actually a uh, wise motion source um, that would be Interestingly, more in tune, uh, you know, they could make vibrations that were more like the sound itself than the sound itself. So, uh, so I mean, in an ideal world, we would have probably designed, you know, a uh, wise motion source for every one of them because it was actually what gave the best result. But, you know, uh, because of time and money and budget and everything, uh, when it was satisfactory, it was okay. Yeah, and we... It was a lot of work. And when we say wise motion source, what you mean is like authoring, you know, vibration that would go alongside the sound, but that vibration is just more interesting, whether it's patterns of vibration that are complementary to the sound that, as you said, feel more like the sound sounds. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's definitely... You know, it's an art form in itself. I mean, a yeah. lot of the design for haptics was uh, we spent a lot of time on the bicycle, uh, like you know, the textures of the different. Because on a bicycle, you're you're holding on to, you know, obviously the the handlebars, and you're feeling the textures of the environments you're sort of traversing through. So there was sort of a lot of care uh, that went into linking haptic textures to the ground textures. You know, that was also like working with the art department about what different textures they put in different parts of the maps, and then sort of translating those, uh, you know, textures into a feeling. Uh, a lot of times it was in relation to what the was happening in the sound design of the, the bicycle already, but um, there was a lot of care that, that, that Vibe put into that part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a great introduction to the bicycle. Uh, we'll come back to the, <laughs> those files uh, quite soon. But uh, first, uh, Manu, you want to talk about the bike? Yeah, of course, yeah, but before to talk about the bike itself, um, uh, I want to say something about environments again, and you will probably call me crazy, but the bike influenced the environment, the 3D audio in this game. So uh, in many games, um, they fade in a uh, wind layer when you go faster. Uh, we did the same. But we also, uh, we did, what we did was that we take uh, the same wind that's already playing the game and uh, we change it by using an RTPC that follows the uh, 
speed of the, the bike. Speed of the bike, <laughs> yeah. So when you go faster, uh, the wind is more present in the mix, and also it's more uh, the pitch is more higher. Um, so that means that if you go through three uh, D uh, spheres yeah. uh, that that are already close to the cliffs or everything. You still hear those, but higher pitched yes. and higher in the mix. Yes, and yeah. there is a place, I think it's in the first right, uh, there is a tunnel with openings on, the, on your right side and a cliff. And uh, what we did, it was we added 3D audio, uh, wind gusts, in each opening of the, the tunnel. So if you are walking uh, in the tunnel, you will not hear it, you will not hear it. But if you go faster on your bike, uh, you will hear some kind of a boom, 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 and some kind of uh, wind whistling, so uh, which make this place pretty special for me because I really like this area of the game. Uh, I don't know if we can hear it or show that. Yeah, it's a great detail. Yeah. It's still pretty subtle, but uh, you know there is a. Hopefully, yes. everyone's listening on headphones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bump up the volume <laughs> and go listen to it like <laughs> the stereo sound is really paying off here because yeah, absolutely. On that right-hand side, as you pass each window, you're getting that that gust and that kind of almost Dopplering of the wind sound. Uh, it's yeah. fantastic detail. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, so yeah, the bike is one of those features that we needed to design it just right. Uh, we want the player feel the most uh, realistic and cool experience riding the bike. So uh, there are several factors on this regard. Uh, for instance, there are two cool things about surfaces. Uh, first one is the bump. Uh, you know, when you're driving a car, uh, the better the car. When you were, <laughs> when you were. Um, uh, Riding your bike. Riding a bike, yeah. uh, and you go from asphalt to uh, gravel. Gravel, do you have a little bump? Well, yeah, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we designed those for some key surfaces in the game. Uh, so just a little bump uh, on the road, and it makes all the difference. Uh, so as you're transitioning, instead of just cross-fading from one surface to another, you're giving that kind of tactile sound yes. and uh, vibration to help reinforce the fact that you've transitioned material types. Yes, cool. exactly. Exactly. It's exactly. like a transition segment in the music system, but for the bike riding. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have, obviously we have like audio loop, loops for each surfaces and various sound uh, from the bike chain and such. But uh, what, it, this, what is the cell sells the bike experience and probably is the more uh, the most immersive topic of this yeah, yeah. it's the haptic feedback uh, in fact like uh, if it said that you should play this game with a PlayStation 5 controllers if you want to live the full experience of this <laughs> if you can do it um, uh, so yeah you can, you can connect the PS5 controller on the PC too uh, right and uh, it, it works that way know. I think I think uh, it's. I, I think it also works. Uh, we should try it. Yeah, it's it's try it. I, I think I it does. Know. I think it uh, works. I, sh I should know the answer to this, but I don't. <laughs> 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 so yeah, when we start to work on it, uh, it was um, it was the first time we tried the resistance of the controller. You know, so to emphasize it, uh, we added a custom haptic, a custom sound, that coupled with this resistance. So that became uh, the first pedaling strike. Uh, of your bike, so you have a little like it's, it's, it's like doing sport in some way. So uh, you, it's a really cool feeling, and you feel it if you're, you're feeling like you are riding a real bike. Uh, yes. So I don't know. We don't have a snip for that. No, no not no, really. But, no, but, but yeah, basically, like the first uh, few strikes when you start biking, yeah. uh, the the haptic feedback is very strong. So yes. it gives a bit of the feeling of you know you're starting to bike. You have to press you know more on the pedals. And then after a few strikes, uh, you know, like the back is rolling. So yes. Then you switch to the the looping parts of the the surfaces and the sounds. And this but is yeah, this is doubled with the trigger resistance as well. On the exactly, yes, yeah. exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. So for the normal ride, uh, we use audio sources. 
some time we have to boost the volume like quite high like because uh, we want to have a, a different effect but we also add the graph uh, as wise motion sources like Nico is showing you yeah so that's like the gravel or something mm. uh, yes. so so yeah um, being uh, being that it's like a two second loop uh, so you you would maybe think that it gets annoying and you you feel the the redundancy but yeah. since you also have a, a few bike loops from the same surface that are audio loops sent to wise motion then everything blends together and uh, creates uh, this uh, randomization so it's yeah so the loop uh, is like uh, less predictable uh, at the end yeah, yeah. Because you have multiple layers of haptics, you have the the wise motion source, yes. and you have the surface material audio loop that's contributing to the vibration in the controller. And yeah, yeah I get exactly. it. Like exactly. all of that variation just lends itself to uh, to being less recognizable. We also had to yes. deal keep in mind the possibility of hand fatigue too, which is something that's very real uh, with the the haptics on the PS5 controllers that we didn't want them to be too intense for too long. Yes. Like eventually they get almost imperceivable uh, when you've been biking for a while. Cause otherwise if your hands yeah. are just rattling the entire time you're playing the game, you, when you're done <laughs> playing, you just, your hands feel really weird. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and, uh, and all this is modulated by the, the speed of the bike. So yes. if you're riding faster, then you have kind of more, you know, uh, it all feels more bumpy than if you're riding, if you're riding slower, then it's smoother. So. Right, because for folks who haven't played it, you pedal the bike by using the triggers. alternating the triggers. Yes, yeah, exactly. As if they were the pedals of the bicycle. Sorry, it just, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. For folks who haven't yeah. connected quite with the game yet, yeah, it's a very tactile experience to pedal the bike because you're <laughs> actively a participant in it. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, all of the considerations you've made around the care of that experience and how it feels over time uh, really makes sense because it should be joyful when you're pedaling well and and on your way uh, you wouldn't want to detract from that uh, experience so nice nice work yeah and that all like uh, again back to this running theme of you know getting the technology out of the way so that you can just experience uh, the intention that the game has for you to be mindfully uh, exploring this world and exploring th this story, um, it really holds up because because that detail, I, I remember it, uh, but now that you've illustrated it so clearly, I, I don't really know that I noticed uh it was you just need to go play again <laughs> it was just a, a very pleasant experience that um that yeah I, I believed it i believed it wholeheartedly so nice work mm -hmm. we talked a bit yeah we talked a bit it. about it uh, i think one last uh, one last thing we had was uh um some some of the keepsakes actually are designed um, oh yeah right you know not like uh a very specific design and uh, one example is the memory flowers right. where actually the three states like you hear them uh normal hearing uh recording in hand recorder in hand and actually recording uh it's actually three different sounds uh, and maybe Spencer, you want to, to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so this was a big uh, sort of collaborative uh, design between me and Kevin, who is the, um, the director of the game, where there were these flowers that feel like they have memories trapped inside of them. And the way that you sort of are able to feel what those memories are or experience what those memories are is by recording them. So there had to be three different versions of how they sounded. One when you're walking around in the game and you sort of walk by them, uh, there's a version where there's a very abstracted version of the memory, which has uh, done a lot of sort of post-production tricks um, in a DAW where we're sort of cutting them up and reversing some aspects, doing some kind of granular synthesis, chopping them up into little pieces and sort of shuffling them around. Um, and they had a part of the requirements from 
the design team was that they had to be inintelligible because we weren't able to uh, have closed captioning for them. So it couldn't be something where you could understand what they're saying because then we'd have to create some sort of system for taking those little snippets and translating each one in real time and it was just not, not feasible. So uh, it had to be scrambled enough where you couldn't really understand what they were saying or what they, what they meant. And then there's a layer of this sort of like shimmering kind of um, drone kind of sound, which is some like FM synthesis kind of like upper particles kind of thing. And then when you pull out your recorder, you lose the sort of drone and you just sort of hear these little shards shifting around where you can sort of hear that there's something in there. You, you're not sure what exactly it is, but you hear little chunks of it uh, more intelligibly. And then once you're recording it, you hear the actual memory. Although it's still a little abstracted, there's still a little bit of a vocoder kind of effect on it um, that's modulated by that drone sound, which is still kind of very faintly present when the voices sort of peek through more. Um, mm -hmm. And this was kind of a time consuming process because the game is localized in Japanese and in French. So we kind of had to do these three different layers in triplicate for every single version of the, of the memory flower. You can listen to, to an example. Yeah. So you can sort of hear that there's something there, you're not sure what exactly it is. There's also some VFX that go along with this that you can kind of see. I I recognize you. Yeah. You're the famous doctor. That's your boy. The one with the visions. I'm right, aren't I? I won't tell nobody. We're just passing through. I have a niece. She, she hears things, voices of the dead. I can't help you. Please, give it some thought. I can't treat anyone here in this valley. This is not a place to get well. Where is? I'm working on that. Take care. It's surreal to find a piece of Dr. Fumio's past so far away from Cairo. And yeah, these... These collectibles are some of the most important in sort of like teasing out what the history behind the landscape is because they're things from, you know, there's a there's a very uh, rough uh, kind of timeline that you sort of start to uncover about the history uh, of what happened in this place. And these flowers are sort of like your only kind of concrete glimpses into little snippets of what happened uh, in this because they happen in the same places where these events took place. But I love the progressive disclosure of it. You start from like a wild abstraction and then through the process of, you know, investigation and then the recorder, you know, expose those memories, expose those uh, storytelling moments. Uh, so really well thought out, implemented and, and a really natural feeling uh, connection. Yeah, it feels really good with the the Tempest audio too. Um, when you're walking around, the way that they sort of catch in the binaural sphere is is really um, kind of has a very almost like ASMR kind of feeling to it. Yeah, yeah, and the full screen visual effects were a great uh, accompaniment. Uh, the way that the whole field of view shifted, it all really worked together and and that's another thread that just runs through this whole conversation is how that collaboration across all the different elements of the experience are working together to communicate and to convey the message of uh, of season so yeah you can tell that uh, that everyone's working together right hmm? yeah. nice uh, and it reminds me of Early on in the game, I, I know this is one of the things you were coming to. It's that uh, you're you're just at the start 
and uh, and there's some humming, there's some narration oh, happening yes. uh, in the background that, uh, you know, again, you're just kind of hanging out and uh, and you're like, what, what's that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. Did you want to pull yeah. up the wires for this or? Uh, sure. Do we have time? Uh, so I'll uh, defocus uh, and reshare. Yeah, just to talk a little bit about some of the philosophy behind these parts of the music system was, especially in this scene, um, you're sort of going between being inside of your house and then having these sort of intimate um, interactions with your mom. And, and so you're sort of walking around after talking to her, looking for these objects. So we needed there to be uh, sort of two different versions of the music bed, one in which uh, it was the usual sort of background way, which is like this piano piece. And then once you go into the conversations with your mom, it, you get the same piece, but it's a sort of heavily abstracted uh, version of the same thing. Um, and we had to sort of blend between the two of them using like a really long crossfade. So when you enter into those, those dialogue scenes, uh, there's this really sort of subtle thing that happens where you shift from one piece of music to the same piece of music in this like really abstracted state. And then w this part with the humming uh, had to be in the same key because uh, all those sort of systems are happening all at once. Yeah, and the, the humming is actually not timed with the rest of the music because it's really abstract. And I feel like uh, there's uh, so much um, a human quality in the humming because it's not necessarily quite in tune or anything. So it, it feels really, um, yeah, natural. Yeah. And uh, a trick also we did uh, to make it even more natural is that, uh, like you can see here, it's cut in, in very many little pieces. So each uh, small phrases are a different file so that when you talk, to your mother, uh, and you 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 lean on the ground, so there's a crack, a wood cracking, a and it interrupts her singing. Uh, we felt like it it didn't need it to come in right away and just stop the music. We felt like uh, you could uh, get away with finishing the small fragment and just not starting another one. So that's another uh, uh, creative use of breaks on and the, and instead of stops mm. and you don't see this the seam of it as much in that way instead of just like a hard fade out which made it yeah. really obvious and yeah shout out phyllis gooden who was the voice actress who did uh like we had some sort of placeholder stuff in here and then when we did the the vo sessions kevin um sort of just gave her like a, a brief of like oh just kind of hum some things and we'll uh, we'll take just you know do it for a couple of minutes and we'll take what we can out of that uh, and this, she just kind of came up with this on the spot. And I think we had like a, a C chord playing. Oh, over really? Okay, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So That's they were present for this session. I was here in Portland, and but uh, the whole team from Wise was there doing because you did all the VO recording in house. So they were there, sort of directing these along with Kevin. Yeah, French and English. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so the Japanese was separate. Here's the background music with the humming. And then if you talk to your mother. And you'll slowly hear the other layer start to come in. It's not necessarily the same delay in game. I'm faking it, <laughs> okay. but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and what I loved about it is that uh, when you're in the when you're in your bedroom at the start, uh, it's positioned in the left rear because this is I'm assuming where the. Uh, uh, where the other room is positioned, where the voice is coming from, where the humming is coming from. And to me, it was just 
so natural sounding, the way that it's processed, the way that it's filtered, the positioning of it, uh, it just kind of melted into the background in such a pleasurable way. Um, and like you said, it all just kind of seamlessly works as you engage. As, yeah, as you can see, we had fun with the attenuation curves again. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, if, if you go. And of course, there's the reverb that's not really there right now. Yeah, this was something that I really wanted to include in th that piece on the soundtrack, but it was a whole sort of separate set of uh, like contracts that had to be written up that just was too much red tape. So the score just has the piano. Yeah, sadly, yeah. Yeah, but you can always fire up the game and experience it. That's true. Yeah. You got that. What a great mechanism for helping support and tell the story though. And, uh, you know, again, having, having the, the vision to capture that in the VO booth, uh, and carry it with such care and precision to a system like this, um, it, again, seamlessly integrates into the way that the game is, uh, you know, expressing this, this story. So, Nice, nice work. Yeah, it, it feels like, again, like at each of these different features, you've, uh, you've really honored the intention of the game at the onset uh, in support of it, the emotional journey that uh, the lead character is on. So, and sound supporting that is all, uh, yeah, seamless, uh, free of the of the technology um, component uh, of course it's there right uh, you have the tools wise is certainly doing something here but you've gotten it out of the way to allow sound to convey the emotion of the experience and I think that's for me the core that runs through the whole conversation today uh, Really nicely done. Uh, do we have anything else to wrap up? Uh, I think uh, it's pretty much what, what we wanted to show. Uh, but I mean, you're very right, and this game is uh, is really special in uh, you know it, its atmosphere and uh, its pace. This house with your mother, and uh, you don't have a transformer or a kaiju that is going to. Uh, arrive and you know uh, bring some uh, huge changes in the mix and uh, so you know it's very intimate and of course in this context it was super interesting to go into really the little details because you can you know yeah. uh, you, because you can and then as uh, as Manu said you know it, it was really a change of mindset and a change yes. of, of perspective uh, you know, it's a very, very special game in this regard. So I think we all love the experience of, you know, going to tweak all those uh, little details to, yeah, to, 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 to make the perfect frog, you know, the perfect <laughs> frog, make the frog, perfect, yeah. it's you know, important. We, we could spend time, you know, just fine tuning yeah. things. I made those frogs uh, with synthesis. Just I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's great. The frogs are fantastic. Uh, great quality triple A frogs. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So an experience that uh, if folks haven't already, get your ears wrapped around it. Uh, definitely try out the uh, binaural side of things using 3D audio on the PS5. Uh, again, I'm always looking for showcases for this technology. Again, I think there's so much that can be gained from experiencing sound in that way. It, and for such a personal game and such a personal experience that you participate in, um, you know, with the recorder uh, throughout, uh, it's just a natural showcase for what audio can, can be as part of an experience like this. So, 
Yeah. Yeah, don't really play it nice. through your TV. <laughs> <laughs> no sound bars for this one. Do what you have to. You do what you have to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. Okay, some good comments from folks in the chat still sticking it out with us. So thanks for hanging around. I've tried to weave in a few questions as they've come up. If anyone has any last minute, there might be a, an opportunity. But uh, ultimately, it's been such a great... Uh, showcase of sound. Uh, season is, you know, a masterpiece of those details, as as someone says here. So many details, right? And I'm sure we're only scratching the surface, and and we wouldn't necessarily know about those if it wasn't for you and your team carrying that information to the community, both in the articles that you've written and here today. So um, jump over to the Audio Kinetic blog and you can check out the longer form black and white text and examples. Uh, this will be available uh, for replay. There's the sound uh, article we linked at a sound effect. Um, the soundtrack is all linked in there for folks. and. Again, just tremendous accomplishment uh, in sound for interactive. So thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having us. Hey, thanks, Damien. Yeah. It was you, really a pleasure. Yeah. You came really well prepared with great examples. And this, uh, I just loved hearing about all the cool stuff you all did. Thanks. So, and those attenuation curves. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. All right, cool. Well, it's another Wise Up on Air. Thanks again for having uh, such a great episode with us. Uh, folks giving a shout out to you in the chat. So thanks again to everyone for hanging around. And we'll see you on the next one. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.